started. I'm Jan Hasaoka. I'm the CEO of the California Association of Nonprofits. We say Cal Nonprofits for short. And this is a nonprofit town hall with assembly member Mike Gibson, who you can see in his Sacramento office, surrounded by flags and posters. And uh, this is an extremely busy time in Sacramento. So we're really honored that he's taken the time today to talk with nonprofits. Um, so just to let you know a little bit about how this is going to work today. So you can place your questions and answers if you want to specifically for panelists, uh, put them in the Q&A box. And if you look at kind of the, move your mouse along the bottom of the screen, you'll see an icon that says chat. And if you click on that, it'll open your chat box on the, on, onto your computer. And if you type things there, everybody can see them. So it's a fun way for you to ask questions or make comments, you know, something like, you know, uh, like assembly member, it looks like you haven't had a haircut in a while or, you know, something like that. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the uh, Q&A box was for panelists only. So please go ahead. I see lots of more people are still signing and letting us know that they're there. This is again the nonprofit town hall with assembly member Mike Gibson uh, from the Los Angeles area. And we also have some other guests today. Um, our, from Cal Nonprofits, our policy director, Lucy Saucedo Carter, who has actually, on a previous job, worked pretty frequently with the assembly members. So they're kind of old pals or co conspirators. Uh, we also have Joanna from the uh, Weingart Foundation and Malika from Love Beyond Limits, but I'll let the assembly member introduce them later. Right, so, um, so we have about 160 people registered for today, so it's a good chance we may not get to all of your questions, but I want you to know that the assembly member staff is also participating in this and they're monitoring and writing the questions down so that even if we don't get to your question, you, it has been heard. Um, and even and you don't have to write just questions either. Write comments too, things that you think that the assembly member and his staff need to know about what nonprofits are experiencing and what nonprofits need right now. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, just a word about Cal Nonprofits. Many of you know we're a statewide policy alliance for the nonprofit organizations, kind of a chamber of commerce, if you will, for nonprofits. We have more than 10,000 members, and we're really happy to be working closely with many members of the state legislature, including Assembly Member Mike Gibson, on matters that are important to the nonprofit community. One of the things that um, we're especially pleased with about this assembly member is that he is, first of all, he's a member of the select committee on the nonprofit sector, which is the, uh, the kind of a, a committee of the assembly uh, that looks over things nonprofits. And so he's showing his commitment to nonprofits in our communities by being on that committee. And he also recently signed a letter along with 30 other legislators um, and one, over 1,200 nonprofits asking for contract relief for nonprofits that have state contracts. Because those of you who do have state contracts know that we need flexibility right now in our contracts because, for example, you know, we're not able to do as many, say, foster care home visits as we used to, or we're not able to give to deliver as many meals on wheels, or we're not able to have the child care centers open that we have at the youth center. So, um, Having that flexibility in contracts is something we desperately need. And we thank you, Assembly Member, for being one of the signatures to that letter. So in addition, let me just say a couple of things about him. Um, the Assembly Member was born and raised in Watts, California. So he really is kind of a hometown hero. Uh, he served on the City Council of Carson for nearly 10 years. Uh, uh, serving on any city council for 10 years, I think it shows a real kind of commitment and dedication. And he is known in the assembly for his landmark bills on providing the internet for fostered and, and incarcerated youth, uh, which I see, Lucy, you must have worked on that bill in your other job. Okay, I, some, I didn't put that together until just now, but yeah, that makes sense. Uh, for humanizing public safety, for addressing homelessness, for standing up for women's reproductive rights, um, and for fighting ghost guns which is a way of saying making it more making it much harder for people to to create untraceable guns so those are all uh, causes that are important and dear to so many people on the nonprofit community as well. He has a lot of leadership positions in the assembly, including uh, being the uh, chair of the Democratic Caucus of the assembly, which is a big deal since you know that the Democratic Caucus is definitely by far outweighs uh, caucuses of the other parties. Um, 
Uh, and he also chairs the Assembly Select Committee on Infectious Diseases in High-Risk and Disadvantaged Communities. And boy, I bet you didn't, but when you were named chair of that committee, I bet you didn't think that there was going to be an in unbelievable infectious disease in high risk disadvantaged communities that would really put your committee into the hot seat. But a couple of things you may not know about him is he's also just known as a good guy, okay, a stand up guy, a good guy, uh, a forceful speaker. Um, but he's not one of those people who always is trying to get in front of anybody else at the microphone. He just gets the work done. And, you know, we can't say that about everybody in the state legislature, but uh, we're very happy to be able to say that about Assembly Member Mike Gibson. So take it away, Mike. Jan, let me say thank you very much for that wonderful and warm introduction. I really appreciate, one, you, uh, two, for the leadership that you provide day in and day out. Um, in our, for our nonprofit, Cal nonprofit, and and being a part of this um, tele town hall meeting that we're having, dealing with nonprofits, and I think everyone, so many familiar faces, Lucy, Malika, um, just thank everyone for being part of this uh, this town hall meeting. Uh, I want to say good afternoon, first and, for, and foremost, recognizing that um, California Association of Nonprofits for your incredible work that you do um, here in California uh, for the people who really need you um, and you provide that kind of leadership. Organizations who are on the uh, teleconference, thank you very much for giving up your time and being part of this discussion. And we wanna pause and thank all everyone for one, um, just being here, just being able to um, not take our breath for granted because we realize that there are so many of our brothers and sisters right now who are struggling to breathe just because of COVID-19 as part of their, their, life's, uh, their life right now. And we um, are pulling together, we can get through this together, but I would say this is in fact trying times um, that we are, are faced with, not only try, trying time in terms of our health, but also when it comes down to nonprofits, right? Today or yesterday, we just passed a budget um, where we're going back and forth with the governor and hopefully that we can reach some compromise and we're gonna come back here next week and do a final vote, Lucy, and um, we hope that we can move California forward. Also, uh, we are under attack again by this an invisible enemy that we see that have that is being so strong in our communities. I, for one, had two uh, family members die of COVID-19, and other individuals uh, that I know are, you know, are tested positive. But I believe we'll get through all this together if we just band together and do what our healthcare professionals uh, ask us to do. I promise you, we will get through this together. For 100 years, Cal Nonprofit has faced um, challenges and you, you, you face these challenges head on. Uh, they were, this were, were women uh, right to vote in 19, uh, 1900s, uh, free, uh, freedom of speech, um, black uh, liberation movement um, in the 1960s, environmental rights in the 1980s, and more. You've been there. We have seen the work that you have done, and you have, a, again, a track record. Um, and I would simply say one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Martha King, um, and that simply is, um, you refuse to be silent on the things that matter. And you, don't, you will not be found guilty of being silent about the things that matter. Certainly our nonprofit community, they matter in this community um, in, in California. Today, we are advocating for nonprofits as they seek to, to uh, just live and thrive and grow during this pandemic um, climate. Uh, Cal Nonprofit also work with legislators like myself and others, uh, nonprofits, uh, building coalitions, to develop legislation that empowers nonprofits and communities that you serve day in and day out. I am proud to be a co a co host of today's uh, teleconference um, with all of you here today. Uh, there is no little eyes or big U's. We're all in this thing together since the mid. March, uh, when COVID-19 um, came in um, and affected our economy, um, we have held these kinds of town hall meetings throughout my district, again, from uh, March all the way up to now, 
we've been holding town hall meetings because we can no longer at this point in time do what we normally would do gather everyone in an auditorium and have a conversation no COVID has changed uh COVID, um has wrecked our normal normal lifestyle and we have to go um in, in making sure that we don't affect anyone but also making sure that our family and friends are in a safe place right now so for my constituents we've been reaching out in a number of ways whether it's meeting with um, mayors and city council meetings whether it's to meet with uh, parents and other stakeholders we've had an abundance of town hall meetings uh, even um, supporting and making people aware of what's going on when we put a moratorium on evictions uh, for small businesses, making sure that those small businesses who were shut down um, as the state was shut down, um, that they weren't evicted from their dwelling, from the brick and mortar, so they can continue to do their business when doors open. We wanted to make sure that the governor uh, executive order spoke to that. And we're happy that we, we did that kind of work because it was absolutely important, Jan. Um, and we must also look at some of the things that we've been doing. And I want to, before we leave, is talk about my um, Assembly Bill 1196, which you may have heard about in the news. We're reforming um, public safety in California as we know it today. And I think it's for the good. And so, Jan, let me again, let me thank you very much for all that you do. I would like to uh, now uh, introduce uh, Miss Lucy uh, Carter, who has, I don't know what I can say about Lucy. She has been a drum major for justice. She has been the kind of person that's in your face um, on the things that matter. She will never be found guilty of not speaking up. She's been speaking out and standing up for those uh, who've been disenfranchised, those been, um, who've been pushed aside, those who've been left dead, those who've been categorized as been invisible. And Lucy, I want to say thank you so very much for just being a partner with me in the things that matter. And so I want to um, hand it over to you uh, at this point in time, I think. Yep. Great. Well, thank you, Assembly Member. It's a pleasure to see you again. And it's been a pleasure to get to work with you. We've accomplished some amazing things. And we're all gonna keep doing that. So, um, well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about federal policy and how it's been affecting nonprofits. Um, the CARES Act, I know you all have heard about the CARES Act, it was passed in late March. And it provided some individual relief programs, it provided funding for state and local governments, but it also created some programs that nonprofits have benefited from, including the Paycheck Protection Program, which is a forgivable loan program um, for small businesses, but includes nonprofits up to 500 employees. And I know that a lot of nonprofits, probably some on this uh, teleconference, have received the PPP, as it's called. So, um, so congratulations if you have got one. And I know now people are turning to how to make sure that they um, make that loan a forgivable loan and jump through all the right hoops. But in that first round of funding, not very many nonprofits were able to get the PPP. Um, and that was a real problem. And that was because a lot of the lending institutions uh, focused on their big clients and really didn't open their doors to nonprofits and smaller businesses. So then the money ran out. Um, and fortunately, there was a second round of money. And that money is still available. It's available only through the end of this month. So if you haven't applied and you think you might qualify please do apply. It is a forgivable loan. So if you jump through the right hoops, it's like a grant. Um, and I can, I'll post some links to give you more information about that. Um, yeah, Lucy, we have a couple of advanced questions asking about that. So if great. you have, like um, some place where people can go to find out where they could, what banks to look for. That would Absolutely. Be I will post a link um, for the SBA, the Small Business Administration's website that act, they have, um, a hyperlink that you can press on and you put in your address and it will tell you about lending institutions that are near you and it's always good to work with organizations that are close to you. And now in the second round of federal funding, fortunately, um, there are some small, smaller lending institutions that are providing loans so it's easier for nonprofits to to access those loans. So I will put that in the in the chat box for everybody. Just a couple of other things. There's an, a new, another federal act that was just passed about a week ago that uh, makes the PPP more flexible. 
uh, nonprofits have been really worried about trying to use all of their money in eight weeks. You now have 24 weeks to use your money and still have the loan forgiven. Um, and you don't have to use 75% of it for payroll. You only have to use 60%. So there's some changes like that that are really positive that have happened in the last two weeks. Um, and for larger nonprofits, a program called the Main Street Lending Program has not been available to nonprofits, but they're, ho hopefully that is changing. The Federal Reserve Bank is taking public comments about that right now. And I'll also post some information about that um, so that larger nonprofits also have a lending program available through the feds. And then I think just the one other thing I'd like to say is that um, we're hearing from nonprofits. I mean, all of us are really worried about the state budget. Um, Assemblymember Gibson, you, you mentioned it. And, you know, we really want to see federal funding, additional federal funding come through to states and local governments so that um, those budget cuts that we saw in the May revise don't happen because we know that they will have a big effect on, on us as nonprofits, but more importantly on our, the communities we serve. So with that, I'll turn it back and I'm happy to take additional questions later and I'll respond to some in writing on the chat and Q&A. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Lucy. And we are hoping and praying that that federal, federal resources, heroes and others come to California because we're desperately needing those, those funds. California had a very robust budget. And when COVID-19 came to town and turned our lives upside down, it, it let, well, it's still here, but we are now trying to close a $54 billion budget deficit. Um, and we're, we're trying our best. Uh, we know that a number of you know, people are going to feel the pain. We're all going to feel the pain, uh, but we must balance our budget. And we, we're in desperate need of the federal resources um, to come through to California. So it can lessen some of the burden as we move forward. But thank you very much. We um, would like to introduce uh, Joanne Jackson, Vice President at the Weingart Foundation, who will tell us about the Weingart, um, as well as give us an update on the local funding for communities uh, that's available, we want to hear from you, and how nonprofits can, in fact, apply. Joanne, thank you so very much for joining us, and take it away. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. Um, appreciate you. My apologies for your um, losses during this difficult time, but really appreciate your leadership on behalf of the sector um, and all you're doing. So thank you, and thank you, Jan and Lucy and Cal Nonprofits, um, for hosting this nonprofit town hall um, with the Assembly Member. You know, I believe um, our ability to be truly effective um, as a foundation and advance our mission is really contingent upon us understanding what our nonprofit partners um, are going through and are facing. And that requires us listening, being in dialogue. So really appreciate all of you um, joining and being here today and for me being invited um, to be a part of this conversation. So as an assembly member said, I am vice president of programs at Weingart Foundation. I've been at the foundation uh, 11 years, almost 12. We're a private foundation based here in Los Angeles, and our mission is to partner with communities across Southern California to advance racial, social, and economic justice. And that commitment is really in everything we do. It guides how we invest, um, who we hire, who we contract with. Um, and our primary grant strategy has been for many years and continues to be the provision of unrestricted operating support to strengthen the capacity and infrastructure of nonprofit organizations that are both providing critical services all the ways to those that are working to build power for systems change and are most impacted um, in marginalized communities of color. Um, quickly, what I could say, um, just, you know, kind of what I'm seeing in terms of philanthropy's response right now um, during this crisis, you know, one of my first um, reflections is that it definitely feels different from kind of the 08, 09 recession. That's when I joined the foundation. I think at that point, there was a greater tendency for philanthropy to um, maybe pause. We didn't, but there was maybe a pullback, um, giving a bit more conservatively, foundations really wanting to protect themselves and their assets. Um, for many reasons, there's definitely been progress in philanthropic practice um, due to the advocacy of lots of folks like Cal nonprofits, um, ourselves, um, other foundations, to really lean into what we would call trust-based philanthropic practices. And so one example you know, is uh, the philanthropy pledge. This is a commitment that foundations have signed onto um, during COVID-19. I think over 700 now foundations have signed this pledge to offer more flexibility um, in their funding, to loosen project restrictions and reporting requirements, make new grants as unrestricted as possible, um, communicate and listen 
to grantees in ways that they probably haven't before in response to this crisis. All of those foundations are listed on the Council on Foundations website, um, but that, you know, just showing a difference in the way folks are responding and the field is responding immediately. And now the conversation, of course, is how do we not stop at these trust-based practices being a response in an emergency, but really viewing them as key funding strategies um, to nonprofit and actually ultimately philanthropic effectiveness as well, and really becoming um, the standard practice moving forward. We also continue to work with our government partners um, as well to ad advocate for more equitable funding, right? Paying full costs, Jan mentioned this kind of streamlining contracting, other things that we could do. That's part of our advocacy effort as well. And then philanthropy at this moment, I think it's also being called as it should be um, and asked to look at its own practices as it relates to racial equity, um, both internally and externally, um, particularly as it relates to the level of investment, for instance, that we're making in Black-led nonprofit organizations where there's still tremendous disparity in giving, as well as Indigenous, people of color-led organizations. And I think you're hearing growing commitments from philanthropy um, to do better in that space as well. But I know we've all been talking about it. You all know better than any of us. Um, the needs are tremendous, um, still growing. Dollars are stretched. You know, our um, nonprofit finance fund um, was just uh, reporting on some, sharing some data with us. And so, for instance, prior to the pandemic, right, over 40% of nonprofits just in the region, just in Southern California, had less than three months of cash on hand. Over 70% had less than six months. So already some economic financial, I would say, fragility in the sector. And now, in the midst of the pandemic, recent surveys are showing over 90% of nonprofits in LA County have lost revenue, right? And then a third report expecting increases in need, but yet 50% have already had to cut budgets, you know, service capacity, 20% are reporting actually having to close or shut down. So this is, you know, we're, we're in a crisis, right? Um, this is a critical time. And so I think this time the sector really sees this as like, this is the rainy day we all talk about and an opportunity um, to try to do more. And I think foundations are thinking creative, cre thinking creatively. I know we are thinking about, um, you know, how to step up and do more at this time, going beyond, for instance, the 5% mandated payout. And what are ways that we can do that? Of course, how this all pans out <laughs> in practice, I think has yet to be seen, but at least I can say it's a different kind of conversation happening than I've ever seen before. So I think this is a moment I saw someone in the chat saying like, this is, this is our moment we have to push. There's an opportunity, there's a window here. And I think we need to do that collectively as a sector. And then locally, um, because dollars are so stretched, you know, gaps and needs are tremendous. I see philanthropy, we have been working collaboratively, I say in Southern California, particularly in LA County really well. Um, but I see that increasing and coordinating even more and particularly cross-sector collaboration, working with government, strategically thinking about, you know, collectively, how are we going to meet the immense needs of this moment, right? How are we going to do that now and moving forward? And so we've been a part of some collaborative efforts, emergency pooled funds. Um, our immediate response really was to contribute to these emergency pooled funds to meet the needs of individuals that were most directly impacted. And I think a data point I just saw, I think 100 million in foundation giving streamlined into rapid response. A lot of that through community foundation partners, um, even some through the city. So multiple, multiple um, mechanisms to kind of pool and get dollars out efficiently. Um, and you can see all of the pooled funds that we have contributed to um, listed on our website as well. Um, and moving forward, we're thinking about how do we continue to support this partnership. So one initiative we've been a part of, the Committee for Greater LA, this is a cross-sector planning process with key leaders in local government, business, labor, um, nonprofit, philanthropy, USC, and UCLA partnering together on the research to develop what will be hopefully a roadmap that will ensure a more equitable recovery, centering those folks that are most vulnerable during this time, um, and really thinking about how do we get um, systems change, structural recommendations, and hopefully um, support advocates to, to do that collectively. Um, all of that said, a lot of foundations are, you know, shifting their approaches at this time. We have as well, so I can probably talk about maybe more of that in the Q&A. Um, um, so I know, I know that that's, that's not easy, um, you know, for nonprofits when funders are kind of shifting and adapting at this time. And I um, noted earlier, 
At the same time, they may be shifting, but also offering greater flexibility. Not all foundations fund that. I mean, um, I would say not fund that. Not all foundations are advertising <laughs> that point. Um, but I would, I would say, I would ask your funders, just like Jan was saying, you know, advocating with, you know, are, are your government contractors um, and contracts also asking your current funders, you know, if, if you could be released from some restrictions on certain deliverables, right, that would allow you, you know, um, to make the kind of investments you really re need to do right now, given the crisis that we're in. Um, government, private funders ask for that, right? It's time to reach out and be in communication with your supporters about what you're facing because there is this window where I think people recognize we need to be operating differently. And so I think you should be able to um, and should push for that. And maybe last thing I'll say before I'm, I'm sure I'm at my time, if you're not a member of Cal Nonprofits, you should be, um, you know, join locally, advocate for these kind of practices um, that maybe, you know, don't always sound exciting and, and um, to do but are really meaningful enabling you to have the kind of resources you need so you can operate in the right way at this moment um, to get the work done and also su sustain um, your infrastructure because that's what you know that's what we're focused on so happy to answer more questions maybe about <laughs> funding later on Ms. Jackson thank you very very much uh, the wine guard has been a part of our community uh, the fabric of California for so many years uh, please give my best to Senator Kevin Murray uh, please tell him I said hello. Um, he's been a great friend for over the years and he's provided great leadership. He and his father here in this building in the state capitol, both as assembly member, uh, dad and as assembly member and a senator, Kevin Murray. And so thank you very much. And I'm sure there'll be some questions for you with all the work that you do at the Weingart um, uh, Foundation. So with that being said, um, Malika, Chris, hello, she, Matt. oh yes. Can I ask for a couple of questions now that have come in? Sure. Okay, thanks. We've got a bunch of questions in the chat and also in the advanced questions that are a little bit similar. So I'm going to kind of lump them together, Joanna. So, you know, they're from the I Did Something Good Foundation, 100 Black Men of Long Beach, the Speak Up Empowerment. A number of groups are kind of saying if you're a smaller organization, mm -hmm. it be an all volunteer organization, um, you know, what kinds of support, how, how do you go about looking for foundation funding in this period? Um, so great question. I don't, you know, we, there's, a, there's a common saying, you know, one foundation, you know, one foundation. Um, they're not all the same, um, but you know, they're, I mean, one I'll say, um, Center for Nonprofit Management is a great resource. So there are some resources out there that you can go to and kind of to get some support, some guidance um, around, um, you know, how to approach foundations to be able to do some research, um, you know, big pieces, you know, what kind of foundations um, align with your, um, with your work and your mission and see where that alignment is. I know for us as a foundation, um, you know, we really make space. Some foundations do have smaller grant programs, entry programs for emerging organizations um, where you're able to introduce yourself um, and you can look for that. Um, I know it's hard when you're starting, um, you know, to to get that kind of first grant. So I recognize that, and we for many years had a small grant program just for that space to do that. Um, so yeah, I know I know there are lots of resources out there in terms of looking for support. And for us, I would say, you know, I I'll, I will say now just to be transparent, you know, with everyone, because I know there'll be lots of questions. Um, we at the moment. Um, in our response, don't have an open application process. Um, you know, we did, and this is just a, a moment um, of a response for us as we think strategically how we're able to invest in key partners at this time. Um, but it's important to know, you know, what foundations do, what foundations maybe have, um, you know, like I said, programs maybe for emerging organizations um, is something to look into and to also either, I, I know I saw Jan put in the chat, um, you know, a partnership in Long Beach, um, other, you know, MSO organizations that are out there specifically to help nonprofits like yours find support and guidance. And I'll just say with us, even though we're going through some transition at the moment, we're always open to a phone call. Um, and all foundations are not like that, but certainly um, don't hesitate to, to, to send an email and ask a question, right? Um, and see if folks are open to at least having that initial phone call with you before you go through all the work of a long application um, where you can. Um, reach out, um, ask other funders to introduce you to under fund other funders, um, ask for those introductions at this time. We try to do that as well. Um, you, should, um, you should also do that. Great. So next, thank you very much. Um, next we ha will have as Malika Chris, uh, who was, who's a local nonprofit 
a love beyond limits. Um, she was also, I might uh, underscore, my 2019 nonprofit of the year in the 64th district. She is tirelessly working in the community for the betterment of the young people, um, older seasoned people. She's just been out there in a real serious way. Uh, and she really has no borders. Even though she's based in Long Beach, she's willing to go to anywhere to show that there's love beyond limits. Miss Chris. I'll mute this. Um, good afternoon, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Mike, um, for continuing to work with us and believe in us. Um, it's so uh, nice to meet you, ladies. Joanna, Lucy, um, Jan, I remember you from Sacramento, and Mike Team. Thank you guys for staying in contact with us. Um, we are one of those smaller organizations. We've been operating for about 10 years. We've been a nonprofit for seven years. So we also have that question of how to transition from just a volunteer based organization, um, for lack of a better word, like to be taken more serious because uh, we do do a lot of work. Um, we're in Long Beach. We serve Long Beach, Signal Hills, South Central Compton. We've been to San Bernardino. Um, we've done some work with a program in Ojai. So it's, it's kind of interesting to figure out like how do we um, how do we be able to compete with the larger organizations um, with our lack of resources, but when we're being such an asset to the community. So thank you um, again for letting us be the voice uh, for the smaller nonprofits. But I do understand part of the answer to my question is these type of forms, um, building relationships. So we have a lot of social capital, um, I network. Um, if I'm invited to the table, I show up, whether it's been um, at meetings, um, now on Zoom, I show up. So networking has been a great opportunity for us. When I started this program, it started at home um, and we were doing everything basically out of our pockets. Then when I started networking, we had a lot of small businesses, a lot of um, women owned business that would support us and have small fundraisers. So that's how we've been able to sustain ourselves and grow. We are in the community foundation building in Long Beach. But again, we want to know how to transition this work um, to a bigger platform, basically. Uh, thank you so much for um, making us nonprofit of the year. That gave us more visibility. Um, and there were some other uh, awards that I was able to excuse me, receive that uh, did give us uh, more visibility. But we need a staff, like we need those um, grant writers and we wanna be able to take some of those volunteers that we have and actually make them staff because they make our program so much better. We have therapists that work with our families. Um, we have a workbook that we put our curriculum in and we actually transition our workbook, which was originally made for middle school kids to Minnesota last year, we went to Minnesota and we were able to work with a um, chemical dependency group that was in recovery. So it was 24 adults that was able to experience this workbook and grow and it was an amazing experience. So we know we have um, the, the ability to continue to create change in families and communities, but we just need support um, financially, definitely, um, to be able to expand our reach. So again, I'm glad to be here and hopefully I'm doing justice to our smaller organizations and um, being able to be a voice for us. Uh, as far as COVID-19, we were able to pivot. Um, the only time we pass out food is during Thanksgiving because we partner with Albertson. So we're able to provide whole Thanksgiving meals for families. And then during Christmas, we adopt families. So we're also um, providing food then. But when COVID-19 came, we were able to change our direction a little bit and partner with two of our mentors that have a catering business. So we've been providing meals for um, single mothers and we actually touched the senior citizen community. So we partner with uh, or um, a senior citizen apartment not far from where our office is. And we've been prom providing meals for them um, on a constant basis. But when it was time for us to request funding for that, the funding went to the bigger organizations because that's what they normally do. And, you know, I felt like I don't know, I felt a little discouraged because we were able to make that change, make the adjustment and continue to be a resource for the community. But um, again, we were overlooked. So I'm just trying to connect the dots to figure out how to um, continue what we're doing. And, and like I said, on a larger scale, because we have the resources, we have the people. Um, 
in place to continue to support us, but we want to be an asset to our families as far as um, um, giving them employment and putting food on their tables and not just always asking for help and support because um, I am very grateful for the relationships that I've been able to build and the people that see us doing the work and they want to help. But like I said, we want to be able to employ people and um, be taken a little more serious. So uh, thank you guys for this platform. I'm trying to read the messages. I did see somebody directed a message to me. So um, we will answer those questions in the Q&A. But um, you can follow us on social media. Our website is lovebeyondlemons.org and continue to, um, continue to do the work. Um, I do want to encourage small nonprofits to continue to do the work because even though we um, love Beyond Limits, we want to create staff and we want to make this change. When we got denied for the grant, we kept going. So we've actually passed out over 2,000 meals since um, March. I think we started about March 20th. Um, so we're not going to stop. We, we keep our head down and we continue to do the work. And that's how we get um, the visibility of people that's, you know, on this call to see us and um, be able to try to connect with us and, and do different things like that. So we'll continue to do the work and eventually um, somebody will say, hey, let us help. Right. Um, so, again, thank you guys. And if you have any questions, I'll see them in the chat. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And let me just say, you may be small, but you're mighty. You're making a difference. You you are, yeah, exactly. You're making a difference in the community. And we see you. We hear you. Uh, we want to invite you to li to link up with Miss uh, Jackson, uh, um, so that we can just have some discussions, some dialogue, to see how. Um, that uh, you can uh, achieve some of the goals by what the Wine Guard and others has to say and try to help um, small nonprofits like yourself continue to stay um, vigilant and also in the community. So thank you very much. At this point in time, I want to want to throw it to uh, uh, Jan, uh, who will lead the uh, queue of the questions uh, from our speakers. So Jan, take it away. Well, we have hundreds, okay? So we may not get to them all. Uh, but, you know, I want to rem remind people that, you know, the, the assembly member staff is also on this call and they're reading all these questions so and comments. So if you have, and you know, and in a town hall, it's not just about hearing from our elected officials, but also telling them what we need. So please use the chat box for that as well. So we have a couple of questions for our, from arts organizations. Um, and they want to know in Sacramento and from foundations, is there some, what kind of help might there be available? Are they being included in the state budget for example. Who's that question directed towards me? You're muted. Anybody, I think it's a question about what kinds of support is possible either from government or from the foundation community for arts and culture organizations. Well, we, well let me just say on behalf of the state, there's a state um, arts council um, within the state of California. And if you have not had an opportunity to check that out, I would certainly invite you. When we were in living in very robust times, um, there were grants that you could apply for uh, and get funded for. Um, and you just need to check and see. We'll be more than happy for my office to try to help facilitate um, a connection with you um, and, that, uh, and that state organization to see what's possible. Again, we, we, we're tight. The state is tightening up their belt um, a number of different ways, and we've been fighting. I've been, you know, fighting just to keep Martin Luther King Hospital's doors open. Um, we're glad that it was not part of either the Senate or the Assembly proposal. It was on the governor's proposal, but we're pushed back just to try to make sure that those doors stays open um, in a community that needs it. And so um, it's tough times right now, but mom always say trouble don't last always, baby. So I'm saying hang in there. Um, and we can be a catalyst to try to help you connect the dots. Anyone else want to take a stab at that question? I'm, I'm happy to jump in, although, you know, we um, at Weingart, arts in and of itself is in a, is in a focus area for us. Um, but I will say, I know, um, whether through, you know, the county art commission, I know there's, a, there's collaborative um, of nonprofit arts advocates that really focus on funding and advocacy for arts funding. So I don't um, have at the moment, but maybe we can send you um, a link on them. And I also know that there, there are funder collaborative groups around arts organizations. We just don't happen to be a member, um, but hopefully we can maybe give you some of those resources where you could see where other folks in the field are, are doing and going to. 
I'll put up uh, websites for Californians for the Arts and also the Art Council that the Assembly member mentioned. I think somebody said to me recently from the Californians for the Arts that artists are the second responders and they're going to be very, very important in the recovery. And, you know, right now when 100% of our museums and theaters are closed, it's certainly a huge concerns for uh, people in the arts community. Well, here's a question from, uh, from an organization that says, you know, if some of your employees do not disclose that they have contracted COVID-19, um, do you have liabilities if they come into contact with clients, for example, or other people? That this sounds like a, a tough one. Like a tough legal question. I hear that you're a legal person. What is, what's your view on that? I don't have the answer, and I would not want to put my, you know, okay. would want to, uh, but I, I will um, put on the, in the chat box some information about reopening, um, you know, th through the um, state public health department and also through the governor's office. There's a lot of information about how to reopen safely, and it includes what to do if one of your employees has uh, COVID-related symptoms. So um, it's not a direct answer to the question, but um, it, it at least is a, a way to get more information. Thanks. Um, here's one for you, Assembly Member. So you mentioned you know, more funding for nonprofits and other people in the state budget. So once the budget is done, how are people going to find out about what funding might be available to them? Um, they should, well, if they should look at the department that they're trying to find money from or seek uh, to get money from and see if in fact, so even though we, we have a budget deficit and we're trying to close that, doesn't mean that there are still not uh, opportunities for nonprofits to, um, to leverage. Um, again, I certainly would ask that you broaden your scope, not only on the state level, but look on the county and also city levels and also the federal government. Um, but again, we're trying to, uh, you know, close our budget deficit. Uh, I think there still will be some resources available. So one, I would check a specific department that you're seeking funding and try to see if in fact they put an, uh, out an RFP or RFQ or something of that nature and apply for it. And it doesn't hurt if you make a phone call and get to know someone on that end to develop a relationship with that individual. So if that individual come across resources and, fund, and funds that they say, hey, well, let's put it out there. You're on the mailing list and you'll be the uh, one who will be contacted. So we have to do that kind of work in order to receive the kinds of fruits that, you, the fruits that you're trying to actually get um, in terms of funding right now. Again, this is not going to last always. We believe the economy is going to uh, turn around. Uh, once we leave from here next week, we're going to be on recess, but we want to also look at and be mindful of COVID-19. Well, we may have to come back. They, they may have to, the governor or the or our leadership in our, in our houses may um, ask us to come back to look at more budget. What we did not know when we moved the, um, the income tax to July, that people were already paying um, their taxes. And so we were able to lessen the burden because we had money coming in. And so that was a good thing. And we hope that we continue to have it coming in um, when it comes down to state income tax that people have to pay and things of that nature, that we will be able to see a, a net gain. We'll be able to fund these kinds of programs that matter so greatly to our community. You know, there's a number of concerns that are also important concerns for Cal nonprofits and I know also for the Weingart Foundation. And that is that, you know, a lot of funding, whether it's government or private funding, doesn't get to organizations and communities of color, including and maybe especially Black-led organizations that are rooted in communities of color. And um, what can we do about that? There's a number of people from such organizations or supporting such organizations on today, and I think this is something we've been working on for a long time at Cal Nonprofits, but we certainly don't have a magic answer for it. And I'm happy to see that so many people share that concerns today. And, uh, what are some of the ideas that we can do to, um, to bring the importance of such organizations to the attention of the funding community, both public and private? Well, I'll just jump in and just simply say one is make sure you raise your visibility. 
um, make sure that you know the policymakers, those elected officials, invite them to certain events that you're having, develop a relationship with them as well as their team. Um, so they can be strong advocates for you um, in Sacramento. When I brought Miss Chris to Sacramento, it was, it was me bragging on love beyond limits because I want everybody in the state of California, including my colleagues, to know the kind of work that she's doing, uh, the kind of work that caused her to stay up way, late at night thinking about how to provide services to the people that she uh, love and, and actually make a difference. Like Mahandi Gandhi say, be the change you want to see. And so certainly she has done uh, and continue to do that kind of work. But it's, it's all about relationships. Um, don't expect um, these individuals come to you. Uh, you have to go to them. Invite them to come down and walk through. Uh, if you have a brick and mortar uh, location, walk down to your particular location. Talk about opportunities that they may have, that they may know, to be able to connect you with uh, some other philanthropy or um, some other wealthy people who want to give to an organization because of the work that you do. I mean, I was happy to, um, I used to go to Haiti once every six months, um, and I would raise money when I was on city council uh, to help uh, build a water well, an orphanage, and all those, those kinds of things. Uh, because ha the Haitians needed it. And people start hearing about what this little council member and, and Glory Christian Fellowship and others were doing, and people just started to want to give money. And so it's that kind of networking that I would certainly challenge you to be able to, you know, have no limits, get, get out of the box and go beyond borders that you think are not open to you and kick indoors and walk through them and try, those could be opportunities um, that await you. And if I could just, you know, jump in and, and also say, Jan, I mean, this is like, this, this is the conversation we need to be having, right? This is so important. Um, you know, we need to be able to talk about the structural and systemic racism that happens and why, you know, just to connect it with someone put in the chat here about, you know, what kind of assets do we need? What kind of balance sheet? You know, Malika talked about, but I have social capital. Like, what is the expectation um, that we come with? But if you have organizations that have been so underinvested, overlooked, you know, the expectation that they show up the same way as a big institution that gets all the institutional funding to be, you know, eligible is not fair. The assumptions that we hold, I, there are several studies that talk about and um, lift up the bias that takes place when folks look at what is the expectation when I see a leader of color? Why isn't there the same level of trust, right? Why do they have to jump through more hoops as a leader of color, right? To prove their worthiness, answer questions, folks not willing to take a risk. So this is just a huge issue and it's systemic um, within, um, you know, it, it runs through everything, right? So it's in philanthropy, it's in nonprofit, it's in all of it. And so I'll just say, you know, um, you need to hold us accountable. We need to hold ourselves accountable. I feel like that's part of my role also in my position and looking at our foundation internally. We go to our association, I'll say, you know, like Southern California, um, grant makers is doing a really good job create you know demand the platform that this gets talked about right Jan is lifting it up and saying yeah so we as Cal nonprofits need to put this front and center and talk about it we need to bring it to philanthropy and put it in your face and talk about it and demand something different um, and so folks are organizing I'll just say there's organizing organizing happening around this there's organizing happening also with some black led groups there's some initiatives in philanthropy there's the black equity collective um, that's being put together so there's efforts happening um, but I think we we just need to not be afraid um, to push this conversation forward and demand that the conversation be had and all the platforms like the assembly member was saying like we got to put it out there and bring this conversation where it needs to be had and hold those that are in power and in leadership um, accountable. And I, I just want to add one other thing. Um, how many of you, um, you don't have to answer, have actually gone to a, your local chambers of commerce mm. and talked to Remember that those chambers of commerce are made up of business owners, people who run companies and corporations, mm -hmm. who would love to hear about the work that you're doing in, as a nonprofit in the community. And also it could be a funding source because you can go there and want to make a presentation, um, be on their agenda and start developing relationships. That's called networking. And so I want to encourage you to start thinking out of the box, not to say you are in the box at all. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but go beyond your limits, you know, and set your, your sights on something higher and something that may be unfamiliar and watch the fruits of your labor yield you great fruit. 
Well, Malika, a couple of people have said that they really relate to your situation. And you know, uh, the assembly members talked about the importance of building relationships. So how did you, from a small organization, how have you done that? Have you just like hoped to run into somebody at the shopping mall <laughs> or like, how do you, how have you done that? Um, honestly, being willing, um, it, it, it takes you to be very vulnerable to step in these places, honestly, because um, I grew up in Compton and South Central, and it amazes me when I look at my phone book now, when I look at um, the platforms and the tables that I come to, I couldn't imagine this little girl being able to talk to the people that I'm talking to, so you just have to I don't know if it's swallow your pride or believe in yourself or believe in the mission or believe that, you know, God have a purpose for you, whatever it is, but you have to move forward. So I've been um, to the chambers. I've asked, can I come speak at Rotary and at Kiwanis and um, wherever I can open a door for people to know who, who we are and what we're doing, that's pretty much it. Um, I was sitting at Albertsons in Lakewood uh, collecting donations for our partnership when I ran into a guy from the Compton Rotary Club. Now I'm a member and I'm the incoming president. So you just have to be able to make those connections. You have to be for me, it was vulnerable because I didn't feel comfortable sitting in the Rotary Club. I didn't feel comfortable going to the chambers and asking them, can they um, adopt one of the families? But as long as I'm out here in the community, as long as I continue to do the work, somebody tells somebody else about what we're doing. And that's really what it has become for me. Um, so like he, like Mike said, I'm not saying you guys are not doing it, but that is one of the things that definitely helped me. Um, I had to continue to network. I had to continue to be available. I had to go to meetings when I didn't want to. I had to miss basketball games for my daughter to show up. I had to sometimes miss back to school night or have them sitting in meetings with me and giving me all the little frowns about continuing to go to these meetings but it's got me on this call. And it's, um, again, we don't have the funding, but we build relationships and the funding is what's coming next. And that's just what I continue to be excited about, continue to push for. Um, so I guess the short answer is to keep showing up and don't be afraid to partner. Like we have a lot of nonprofits that we partner with. I love relationships. Um, there's organizations that we work with, we literally overlap, but if we are doing the same thing, they might be able to connect to a child or a family that doesn't quite receive us and vice versa. So you have to be able to connect. You have to be able to um, build those relationships and don't try to do it yourself. You will run yourself in the dirt um, trying to fix it all yourself. And we're wide expanding. Like I thought that was one of our problems because we have so many niches. We're not just a mentoring program that mentor kids. We embrace the families. We mentor the parents. We give them life coaches and mentors. Um, if there's, grandparents in this situation. We try to connect generational um, things that's going on. So we want to embrace the whole family because we don't want to cause division. So that's a part of the community too. We have to embrace the whole community and bring everybody to the table so that they can hear our voice and they can know how to help. Sometimes people don't even know how to help you. So that's another um, situation that we run into. So definitely getting out in the community and um, I don't know if they can contact me directly, but um, if you want to email me and follow me to meetings, um, go ahead. Uh, I'm definitely, a lot of people ask me, how do you start a nonprofit or how can you help me? I can't help you as far as the nonprofit thing, but you definitely can meet me where I'm at, at these meetings and you can present yourself. And I've always been open to that. So um, thank you for all the people that um, actually invite me. Uh, our president right now is Candace Yamagawa. I know she's invited me to a lot of places and uh, Susan Mal um, Maliki has invited me to a lot of places. So that's how we've been able to spread our wings is showing up. You know, I, would, I just wanted to quickly add that um, going to your local elected officials, so city council members and county board of soups also to talk about the work you're doing in your community. And there's federal funding coming down to some of those local governments too. So you wanna make sure that you as a nonprofit are being included in being able to access that funding. So add that to your list of nonprofit uh, or of uh, networking folks that you're gonna go talk to. Okay, we're just, uh, we're out of time. So I want to uh, 
say, uh, we, you know, we had 80 people here today, which is really great. Um, and thank the assembly member, you know, he could have been having like another, you know, a cup of coffee or something, uh, but he's uh, showing his commitment to nonprofits and to our communities by participating in this. So let me turn it back to you for some closing words, assembly member. Thank you very much to each and every one of you. Jan, you've been, you've been great. Um, to each and every one of you who are here, I'm happy to uh, share this platform with you. I think you are incredible beyond measure. Uh, Lucy, I look forward to you with you, working with you again to help uh, create uh, policies that make, uh, that matters, that matters to the people uh, of this great state. And we wanna encourage all the nonprofits to again, to reach out to, uh, hopefully Ms. Jackson will make yourself available and people can call you because, you know, people look towards your foundation um, as someone that can be a real leader and, and as a mentor as well. And so nonprofit organizations play a vital role in building healthy communities by providing critical services. Um, and by being a safe network, especially in times of emergencies like we're in right now. They also strengthen communities, um, which is important um, ways that we can really look at in a tangible way. They provide everything from um, after school tutoring programs to um, housing of our homeless brothers and sisters. Um, they can, um, uh, be small community food banks, uh, something big like Martin Luther King Hospital. Uh, mix of difference, big or small, you are significant to the work uh, that we all must roll up our sleeves and do um, in the entire state of California. And again, I want to thank everyone, uh, nonprofit leaders, for being here. Your voices. We want to be able to get back with you with some of these, um, um, some of your questions, and we want to provide these answers. To, to you, and uh, if you could please make sure that we have the information. You can certainly um, reach out to me at www.asm.ca.gov backslash Gibson, G-I-P as in Paul, S-O-N. If you go to my website, our website is updated on a daily basis with new information. You will see a lot of stuff on there talking about Assembly Bill 1196, and 1196 will place a ban on chokeholds and the carotid restraints um, in the state of California. We will invite you to write a letter of support for that particular bill. Uh, we believe in it. We believe what it's going to do once it's passed and the governor uh, signatures on it um, to help heal our community. We're in that time and we need you. Our communities need healing right now. And you as nonprofits, you provide that in so many different ways. Continue to uh, follow your dream, continue to have vision and, and vision and dream big. So I wanna thank each and every one of you for being part of this uh, Teletown Hall meeting. I wanna thank my team um, and everyone on the call. So thank you so very much. God bless you, stay, stay safe, stay healthy. Let's stay together. Thank you. Bye-bye, y'all.